but this is like nourishment. Like you're reading this and you're coming, you know, I take notes when I listen to your podcast often, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Don't listen to Irish person. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the 155th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday the 25th of March 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week I'm delighted to welcome Daniel Bitten to the show. Daniel is the man behind the What Is Politics podcast where he recently did a deep dive into the anthropological research about immediate return hunter gatherer communities. We discussed the importance of this research for our liberatory politics and dispel the capitalist myth that freedom requires inequality. This week, I have the following new patrons to thank. Raoul Duke, Abra K, Simon Turner, James, Jared Komorowski and Waxed Grinch. This Sunday, at noon Eastern Standard Time and 4pm London Time, sees the start of the new patrons-only reading group of the brilliant fundamental principles of communist production and distribution. So if you'd like to join in and get access to part two of this interview and all the other patron-only episodes, head on over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Okay, let's hit the interview. So Daniel, thanks for joining us today. Tell us a bit about your your YouTube channel and your podcast. All right. It's a pleasure to be on your show. I've been listening to it for uh, about a year and uh, enjoying filtering the, uh, the archives and learned uh, many a thing, many a book that I'm too lazy to read and uh, <laughs> all kinds of great stuff. Okay. So I made a podcast. It's called What is Politics? And it's a audio podcast and a YouTube channel. And the point is just to clear up the garbage, the mess that is political theory. And to do it, at a very basic level for Joe Blow on the street, but also some things, not, not highfalutin theory, but things that even, you know, your PhDs in political science don't really have, often haven't really thought of. So basic definitions of words. Politics is a domain where it's one of the only practical, politics is the only practical domain that I know of where none of the main terms have any consensus definitions. So, for example, imagine if you were a surgeon and you're working with a team of surgeons and no one has the same definition of, you know, your aorta or this uh, vessel or this scalpel or this uh, instrument. So you're working with your team of surgeons and you're like, "Uh, hey, buddy, can you pass me that uh, that knife over there, that guy over there? And he's like, which one? This is the pointy one? Oh, yeah, the sharp one. Oh, okay, okay. Here, here. And uh, make a cut there. Then that that big vein near the heart, that thingy over there. Oh, okay, this one. Oh, no, no, not that one. You know, and the guy's like bleeding to death and everybody's dying. That's the state that we're in in politics. And that's kind of a metaphor for what is happening to us in the political world as a result. So just basic terms like government, politics, socialism, capitalism markets, democracy, the, these are all meanings that have contentious competing definitions and the definitions that we haven't even thought about. So part of my project, my ultimate project is to have people, including myself, become effective political actors because we're all upset with the way things are going. We want to do something about it, but A, we don't know how to do it, and B, we don't even know how to communicate with each other, right? Because we're, we're watching different uh, media, we, we have different ideas of everything, different uh, narratives, but also just different definitions of basic terms. Uh, so, you know, I would sit, you know, with family members or just people I know, and they'd be telling me something like, oh, you know, this healthcare system's falling apart. It's terrible. The government needs to put more money into it. We need to tax the rich more. We need to put more money into our system. And that's why I'm voting for the Conservative Party of Canada, you know, or someone in the States is like, oh, we need a, you know, a healthcare system for everybody. That's why I'm voting for Donald Trump. And I'd just be like, what the hell is going on with everybody? Like, I don't have to know. You don't have to know the Conservative Party of Canada. I don't know the Conservative Party of Holland, but I know that they want to privatize healthcare. Their policies are for the wealthy because you just know these fundamental things about what is left, what is right. And I realized nobody knows these things. And then I sat down to try to figure it out and, and just make an easy to understand explanation. And I realized I don't even know what left and right mean. And I'm looking up for de- I'm looking up different definitions. And every website, every dictionary has a slightly different definition. There's six, there's four or five definitions floating around. 
So I realized that there's just this whole mess. Every single word needs to be defined. We need to talk about why, the, where do these definitions come from? We need to figure out choosing a definition. How do we choose a definition? Is there a correct definition? Is there like, you know, uh, what do you call it? definitional entrepreneurship? Should we try to champion new definitions, which happens? Like the word racism in the last 10 years has changed definitions. Is that for, the, for better, for worse? Who's doing this? Why? So <laughs> we're going through all this nonsense. And uh, more recently, I've been talking about uh, materialism versus idealism, which is, you know, sort of stupid 19th century debate. But it's quite important because one of the shortcuts that we have, you know, politics is all about building coalitions. Yeah, you know, me by myself in my room, unless I get a nuclear bomb, no one's going to listen to me. I can't, uh, you know, get any policies passed that I want. So you need to expand your coalition. But you need heuristics, you need, you need shortcuts to figure out who are the people that I should trust, who are the people that I should be wary of, you know. So when you see Bernie Sanders getting out there saying, uh, you know, everyone should have free you know, Medicare for all, and then you see Pete Buttigieg up there saying Medicare for all, who want it, terms and conditions apply. You're like, you need, like, how do I know who to trust? And material conditions, understanding material incentives, uh, how the material world shapes people's values, how it influences their behavior. That is how you figure out who to trust in the shortcut without just doing massive, you know, nobody has time to do like an in-depth study of every single politician, every single policy, every single this, every single that. So these are shortcuts that we can have to help us figure out who our friends and foes are. So linked to that, we talked there about the material conditions affecting people's behavior. You've recently done it. Well, you've recently done two videos about the anthropology behind, well, I suppose we would call it uh, communism, immediate return hunter-gatherers, and the origins then as well of male domin dominance and hierarchy. I think these are, they, they fit very well into the, the interview we did with Chris Knight on the work of David Graeber recently. Do you want to tell us then a, a little bit about, about anthropology of these early hunter-gatherers and why you are a materialist? So, so yeah, that David Grave, that interview with Chris Knight really blew my mind because he happened to be talking about exactly what I've been uh, working on lately. And what happened was I made, I wanted to explain why are some societies hierarchical? Because basically if we're on the left, you know, let's start with the definition of left and right. If we go through uh, historically where those terms come from and how they've evolved uh, and the competing definitions, we settled, you know, you can watch episode three, uh, episode sorry, five on that. But we settled on the correct definition for many reasons. Left equals equality, right equals hierarchy. The word politics means anything to do with decision-making in groups. That's the definition that I use. And we have political hierarchies where some people have more decision-making power, decision power than, other, than others. A hierarchy is where some value, something is ranked according to some value. And we're talking about politics, we're talking about decision-making. So therefore, people are ranked according to their decision-making power, okay? So all, all our societies, all the politics that we know of, all the conflicts that we know of are about hierarchies, different people, different classes of people within hierarchies fighting, struggling for more or less uh, decision-making power. So the right are the forces of existing hierarchies, or they want to create new hierarchies, uh, where some people have more decision-making power than others, and the left are the forces of the people who want to reduce or entirely eliminate existing hierarchies. And as people who are communists, anarchists, socialists, these sorts of things, we are on the left, we want to get rid of hierarchies. So I wanted to talk about why is it that some societies are extremely hierarchical, some more than others, uh, you know, where it's, a, you know, we have monarchies, you have uh, top-down dictatorships, and we have some kind of like hybrid system where people get to vote every few years, but we don't make any actual decisions beyond that, we choose our representatives. And then something that most people tend not to know about is most hunter-gatherer societies, and not, not most hunter-gatherer societies, there's a specific type of hunter-gatherer societies called immediate return foragers. Immediate return means that they gather and hunt and usually eat and consume the foods that they procure in a short amount of time within a couple of days without storing much food and without processing it extensively. Okay, so this type, every immediate return hunter-gatherer society that we know of is extremely egalitarian, but also extremely, there's lots of freedom and autonomy, meaning there's no, you know, in the Cold War, we were brought up to believe that 
you, there's a trade-off between equality and liberty. You either have a more equal society, but you need some kind of Stalin on top of it to, to keep everyone, uh, to force everyone to be equal, or you have freedom, but then you just have, you know, uh, Charles Dickens, uh, you know, poor poverty and there's people dying in the streets, uh, no health care, and other people just swimming in buckets of money, and that's, that's the way, that's the choice that we have. Well, this isn't true because all the immediate return hunter-gatherer societies that we know of are extremely, extremely egalitarian, but not have like no political hierarchy that we can, you know, determine. There's no chief, there's no religious leaders, men don't dominate women, adults barely even dominate children. It's really fascinating. And what's more is that in all likelihood, most human beings for most of our history as a species were probably immediate return foragers. So what I was trying to do with my video series is explain why is it that these, first of all, to introduce people to the idea that human equality is possible and coexisting with liberty. And I would say that liberty is actually a precondition for equality and vice versa. You know, the French Revolution, the, the slogan was equality, liberty, and fraternity for a reason. Uh, and you'll see those kind of those kind of slogans and ideas throughout history, like in the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, you see something similar as well, and I talk about it in my newest episode. But I wanted to explore why is it that some societies have hierarchy and other societies have this extreme equality? What is it about our, our you know, is it just our ideas? Are some people just assholes and they want to be hierarchical? Or are some people just uh, such great, sweet guys? We're Smurfs at heart, so we, we want equality. And so that's what I was preparing to do with, with this episode. And after I put out that episode, I had all these people writing to me telling me, like, oh, well, you know that David Graver disproved the, that the hunter-gatherers were egalitarian. And I'm like, oh, God, because, you know, anyways, I can go on about that later. So that's... Go on, go into it. Tell, tell, us, tell, tell us a bit about that, like... This is a critique that Chris Knight made of it, uh, uh, of David Graeber, and I've had so, some some pushback from people about it. I'm not an expert in anthropology. So you've got a master's degree in anthropology, and you know the stuff, you know the, the literature. What exactly is the argument here between the these kind of a, maybe a more postmodern and a kind of a classical kind of, I suppose, materialist anthropological view? So what, what kind of pushback did you get? What did people say to you? People were saying that that Salins, who wrote the book with David Graeber, had done extensive stuff on hunter-gatherers, which wasn't, that wasn't what Chris said. He never said that Salins di didn't do it. He said that, like, Graeber didn't interact with the kind of leading hunter-gatherer kind of materialist anthropology. I, pres I think that's fair to say what Chris's critique was of him. Yeah, that's bang on. Like, what... what what I know, so when I was young, uh, I got into hunter-gatherer studies just randomly. I was, uh, I'm a musician still, uh, and I was a musician back then. And I was just going through the library. You know, John Coltrane, uh, I read in one of his biographies that he was very influenced by the music of uh, pygmy people in Central Africa. So I was like, oh, you know, he was interested in that. Maybe there's something there that I should uh, go check out. So I, I, I listened to the music, and I, and I saw the anthropologist who recorded them. His name was Colin Turnbull, and I read, I read his book about these People and, and this is one of these immediate return egalitarian societies. So my mind was completely blown that such an egalitarian society can exist. I didn't know that it was even possible for human beings to live like that, never mind that we might have been living like that for the majority of our existence. And then as I, you know, grew and, and learned more about politics, I got all into Noam Chomsky, and I found out, of course, about uh, David Graeber because I came deeply into anthropology, deeply into uh, socialist anarchist politics. And so here's this... this uh, anthropologist who's brilliant, who is an anarchist, and I was very, very interested in him, started reading a lot of his books, and he's a brilliant writer. He's a rare, you know, anthropology suffers from all the plagues of academia today. Yeah, there's a lot of gibberish, there's a lot of, you know, writing that's just for a tiny audience, it's very neoliberal in scope, there's, no one's asking great big social questions anymore, and everyone's afraid to answer. The culture of anthropology is that how dare you think that you could answer these great big uh, social questions? Like, who are you? You're a dog. Uh, you have to just bow before all the great theorists of all time. And if you say any sentence, you have to cite 14 theorists before you say the sentence, you know, and don't get any ideas about anything. So it's, it's wonderful to have someone like David Graeber out there running out there and asking all the big questions of our day. How come we're only, you know, why are we working so hard today uh, when Keynes predicted that we'd be, working, we'd be working 15 hours a week with all the new technology that we have? It's a wonderful question that David Graeber asks. Uh, 
you know, and he's also talking about hierarchy and equality. And he asks the same question: Why do we have some societies that are hierarchical? Why are some societies egalitarian? Can, is there any prospects for uh, equality in uh, industrial civilization? Which, of course, is the question that we, uh, as you know, socialist leftists, want to ask. So he's a wonderful anthropologist. Except I was reading his stuff, and I'm like, of course, he's going to talk about these pygmies and these other uh, egalitarian foragers. And I read more. There's, there's six or seven different groups of societies that we know of. Uh, like this, and he just never mentioned them once. You can read hundreds and hundreds of pages of his wonderful, interesting writing, and there's nothing in there about it. I'm like, how does this guy? He's an, he's an anarchist. Like these societies are anarchism in motion. They have no leaders. Uh, they have perfect equality. And what's what's his problem? Why isn't he writing about them? Anyhow, so it is very strange, and Chris Knight pointed it out that he doesn't engage with any of the literature on any of these societies at all. He rarely mentions them, and if so, just to poo-poo the idea that they are, are all that egalitarian. And whenever he tries to talk about egalitarian societies, he's, he's always trying to say that there are no real egalitarian societies. Like in that book on kings, uh, in, in the beginning, in one of the first few pages, he talks about how even you know egalitarian hunter-gatherer societies have really hierarchical religions. Nobody's, you know this utopian uh, egalitarian society. And then he cites cultures who are not immediate return foragers. So they're not egalitarian foragers. They're less egalitarian. They're more egalitarian than, than our society is, like the Inuit, for example. But they have, for example, patriarchy. And, and there's many other societies like that who are more egalitarian than we are. You know, if you look at the Vikings, uh, many of the Vikings or, or, or like uh, Arab Bedouin, they're much more egalitarian than we are, but they're also very patriarchal or they have other kinds of hierarchy. So these are not the societies that us as socialists, communists, anarchists should be all... I mean, we should be interested in all the societies, but the ones that we really want to focus on are these immediate return forages. And this anarchist writer, they don't exist. And if he ever talks about egalitarianism, he's always trying to disprove egalitarianism by talking about other societies and ignoring these societies. And I don't know why he did that. I think he just didn't believe that these books were real. I think Chris Knight mentioned that he heard David Grave or someone told him that David Graeber behind his back had said that, you know, these societies, it's all bullshit. It's not real. Uh, it's all made up, which is very 80s and 90s. You know, some of the writings from the 60s, Colin Turnbull's writings were pretty, they're written a bit like a fairy tale. So I could see that you would be a bit skeptical of that stuff. But by now, you know, we're in 2020. There's been dozens of, of ethnographies from all kinds of different people written from all kinds of perspectives whether they're just like weird, you know, behavioral ecologists measuring how, how many hours people sleep and how much they poop and how, many, how much sex they have to, to other people who are writing more, you know, and there's really interesting studies on this stuff. But, uh, you know, the super scientific studies to other people just writing, you know, social, very well-written literature, you know, ethnographies. And these are extremely egalitarian societies. It's not making it up. And this is a conspiracy by like 50 different anthropologists. We're not making this up. There's something weird in David Graeber that he's ignoring this. And so I put out this episode talking about some of these societies, and then I get all these David Graeber fanboys saying, like, oh, you know, David Graeber disproved this, you know? And I was like, oh, fuck that guy, you know? Like, he, the problem with David Graeber is he's brilliant, he asks the right questions, but his mind is not tethered to reality. Well, he's, he's dead now, his mind, you know, is in outer space or whatever, but he's not, he never had any materialist conception of anything. So, like when you don't, when you're not tethered to material reality, materialism helps us predict human behavior. A really simple, you know, you're an economist. A really simple example is supply and demand. If there are not very many apartments for rent, you know, there's five apartments for rent, but there's ten people who want those apartments. We all have agency. We have free choice, but we know that most probably the people will start bidding up the rents because they'll see like, uh oh, I can't get this place because three other people want it. And the landlord's going to notice that too. So he's going to be, you know, asking for more and more. And so supply and demand, because of the material conditions, the fact that there's less apartments and there are people who want apartments is in that state that prices will go up. And that's just predicting human behavior by material conditions. So it's really important. And someone like David Graeber has no sense of this whatsoever. He's actually rebelling against, rebelling against this idea. I, he, everyone has some sense of material conditions. We all understand that if it's cold outside, we have to put on a coat, you know, but people don't want to take it much further than that. They're afraid of it because they think that if I'm talking about that, everyone who does a immediate return hunting and gathering lifestyle is going to end up egalitarian. 
than what they're afraid of and what David Graeber is explicitly afraid of is that everyone who lives in an industrial society, the flip side of that is that everyone who lives in an industrial society has to live in a hierarchical society. It is just the nature, the material nature of a complex society with uh, millions of people and uh, complex institutions, healthcare, armies, police, whatever it is, that it is not possible for such a large society to be egalitarian. So David Graeber is caught up in that myth in that narrative, and we have, you know, some writers have been writing that. Obviously, uh, people on the right want us to believe that. And David Graeber got caught up in that, and it's what he was trying to do. And he, be- I think, he kind of believes that, believed that deep down. So what he tried to do with the David Wengrove, who's an archaeologist, is they tried to say that, well, human beings don't operate according to the material world. It's just our ideas. You know, we consciously, self-consciously experiment with different types of social structures, and maybe sometimes we get stuck in some kind of hierarchy, but uh, it's all just inside. We smoke a bunch of weed, and we just think about all these different ideas, man, and then we, we, we try them out. And that's garbage. It's nonsense. I agree with Graeber, because he wants to say that there is possibility for social change. We can't, we don't have to live in hierarchy. And I agree with him on that 100%. It's just that his reasoning is terrible. It's like someone who you know, like when you do a math math homework, you might get the right answer, but all your calculations are garbage. You know, you get one <laughs> out of ten. So David Graeber gets one out of ten by accident. He came at the right answer, but all his work is garbage. <laughs> in that, <laughs> not his work in general, but his work on that subject is garbage. And he wrote these beautiful essays. Uh, there's two of them. One is called uh, Farewell to the Childhood of Man, and the other one is called How to Change the World. And they're really going through the archaeology of prehistoric humans, and, and they're trying to say that, oh, no, we have tons of hierarchy since the beginning of time, and uh, it has nothing to do with anything. It's just people chose different things for, for no particular reason. I don't know. He's, a book is supposed to come out about this, and I'm hoping the book... I mean, I, I don't want to see these articles are terrible because they're well-written and they're asking interesting questions, so they're very stimulating. They're great. No one else is that. Very few other people are asking these questions, but it's garbage <laughs> in the sense that the answers he's getting at are terrible. And, you know, look... In, a, in jazz, if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying, right? Like, you got to try crazy stuff, and you fuck up, and then you correct it. So maybe, you know, the, the book's going to be better, but it's just garbage, and it's making people stupid, and it's taking away one of the big arguments that we have on the left. Like, the archaeology is debatable, so there's room to say that well, it's, there probably was some hierarchy in the Paleolithic era, in the era in which we came up as a, as a species, and I assume there was some a little bit here and there throughout the Paleolithic area era, but we have plenty of reasons to believe that we were mostly egalitarian forgers, and it's shaped who we are as human beings, our bodies, our, our personalities, all the stuff that Arnold uh, Schroeder talked about. Our psychology is shaped in part by this egalitarian background. But there's also, let's say, a hierarchical background. But in our arguments with people, one of the big weapons, the arrows we have in our quiver is I can whip out and say, well, you know, this the consensus among anthropologists is that we've been uh, these egalitarian societies for something like these uh, egalitarian societies, uh, some variation on them for most of our existence until recently. And people are like, wow, I didn't know that. So it's a great, you know, uh, this is a narrative tool. It's a very good political weapon. Like, Absolutely. That hierarchy is the exception. That's why we're all messed up. We're in these crooked ass hierarchical societies. Well, exactly. The way I look at hierarchy a bit the way I look at sugar overeating. You know how, like, in the Paleolithic era, so the theory is that the reason we love sugar and salt and fat so much is that there wasn't so much of it around. So when you find, you, when hunter-gatherers find some uh, beehives, they really dig into that beehive and they eat like 10,000 calories worth of, of honey and, and, and honeycomb and they, and they, you know, engorge themselves and then they pass out, you know, in an <laughs> insulin shock for the day and then they have a great old time because... They're not eating that every day. Like we go to the grocery store and you have like, you know, Hagen dazs and, and Kit Kats and Snickers and Lucky Charms and whatever. We're just eat, eating this stuff all day. We're going to be sick. But we have the craving for it because it was an occasional thing that you wanted to be motivated to go get that because those calories are good to have every once in a while. They'll help you survive. So same thing with fat, same thing with salt. So hierarchy in these egalitarian societies, like the, the ones that I've been talking about, they're egalitarian because, and my big argument is that the reason they're egalitarian is because they have actually no means of dominating one another. The reason we have hierarchical societies is because 
one person is able to control or own, and ownership is just really control, resources that another person depends on to survive. We need money to survive. Money is attained through jobs. The capitalists own the jobs. Uh, unless you have capital to start your own job or unless you're like some amazing you know, singer or something like that, you are dependent on another human being to survive. Therefore, there's the dominance hierarchy. The boss, the owner, tells the manager what to do. The manager tells you what to do. You're on the bottom. There's your hierarchy. Somebody owns something that you depend on to live. I live in an apartment. I want to paint the walls plaid and purple. I can't because there's a landlord who says no way. And he doesn't live there. He's never even seen the place, but I have no, you know, he's the owner. The owner controls. There's a hierarchy. So the reason there's egalitarian societies is because no one is in any position to, it's not because they have some great values. People, there are still people like Arnold Schroeder will tell you, there are always people who kind of want to dominate other people. There's people who want to control, but, and although they do have a value system that's extremely egalitarian, there's just, if somebody wants to dominate someone else, there's no way for them to do so. All they're just doing is just causing shit. Because you start trying to aggressively bully people, you start trying not to share your resources. Well, the fact is they're always mobile. So there's sort of ingredients to the, their egalitarianism for those societies. It has to do with mobility. It has to do with, because you, you, there's nowhere to store things. Anyone can always just leave and go to another band if someone's bothering them. So this recipe basically creates... The material conditions are such that no one has a big bargaining power advantage over anybody else. And then culture comes in to stabilize that, that situation because if somebody wants to dominate, they can try, but they're never going to get anywhere. So all you can have is chaos of people fighting back and forth and pushing back and forth, and society will eventually collapse if you're doing that. So you have these egalitarian institutions that sort of stabilize it, and you know nobody really tries to push very hard. If they do once in a while, they get smacked down or they even get murdered sometimes. You had an interesting example, I think, of... I was at the Hamza where they where they murdered some guy who had killed... Well, they, they killed a guy who had killed three people. That's right. It's the Jew Hansi who are the Kalahari foraging people. You'll see them uh, frequently. You know you know those movies, The Gods Must Be Crazy? I don't, but... Well, anyways, because okay, so they filmed it once there. So it's Richard Lee's the, the famous anthropologist who wrote a lot about them. Yeah, and he reported... And there have similar stories in other societies where, yeah, there's a guy who's just a bully and he had been haranguing people and, and, and he, he'd killed, I think, three people over his life. And normally, if there's any fights, you have your people that will back you up and the people that will defend you. But in this case, this, everyone realized that this guy's a pain in the ass and he's causing too much trouble and, and strife in a society. So his people let other people just kill him. They didn't fight back, you know, and then everybody, including his people, ritually stabbed him you know they speared like some men killed him and then everyone in the village men men and women alike stabbed him one time to show that they collectively are responsible for this death and it was kind of like a capital punishment a democratic capital punishment so that's the and that's the one of the reasons why we don't have big dominant alpha males that are like uh you know in so there's a book called hierarchy in the forest by christopher bohm and he's going through our common ancestors with chimpanzees and gorillas and bonobos was most likely hierarchical. But what happened is when humans developed projectile weapons and poisons, any wimp, any Pee Wee Herman can kill any Hulk Hogan, right? Me. <laughs> exactly. 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 So if, if you learn a bow and arrow, you could kill Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, back, you know, peak Arnold Schwarzenegger, 1979. So any woman, any weak man, anybody can kill anybody else. So what happened is all the belligerent, annoying guys eventually just got killed off, you know. And if you couldn't control yourself, someone's eventually going to kill you. So over time, sexual dimorphism changed. It, anyways, it's part of our evolutionary heritage, this egalitarian ethos. It's the He calls it reverse dominant hierarchy, dominance hierarchy, where the, the people dominate the potential alpha male. We've talked about these initial return hunter gatherers so in, in my mind a lot of these are you know hunter gatherer foragers quite nomadic probably sometimes linked to following herds of animals around the place where they don't set up permanent store and they don't consume a product that allows itself to be stored but we also then have these kind of more permanent hunter gatherer kind of hybrids like in the pacific northwest do you want to tell us why they are different compared to these other hunter-gatherers and what are the material conditions there that 
cause them to be different. Yeah, and this is just classic. So David Graeber would tell you something like, oh, well, they just had a different conception of spirituality and they had a different cosmic ideology. But, you know, any materialist will tell you that cosmic ideology most likely came out of the material condition. So the term hunter-gatherer is a bit contentious but because it, it, it just means it's, it's a big grab bag catch-all term, which means anybody who doesn't do agriculture or animal uh, pastoralism, animal herding. So you have people like we talked about who are nomadic, who that's the classic sort of immediate return hunter-gatherer who is following, you know, they stay in a camp for a week or, or so, and then they move around following as they consume resources, they, they eat up, you know, what's, what's around, and then they follow animal migration patterns because that's where they get a lot of their protein. Then you have other kinds of hunter-gatherers who are sedentary, who have much denser populations, who stay in one place, and who have dominance hierarchy, chiefs, classes, there's nobility. So among the Pacific Northwest Coast, there's several cultures, uh, the Kwakwakwakw, Kwa- Kwa- oh fuck, I forget how to pronounce them. They historically used to be called the Kwakutl because the uh, North Americans couldn't pronounce their names. Anyways, the Pacific Northwest Coast cultures that Franz Boas studied, and that, that makes some of the most beautiful art uh, that we know of, these beautiful drawings of salmon and different animals. And, and they have these, these crazy wild masks because they have a culture that's all about deceit and, and different personalities. The same person has different personalities and different uh, costumes. And we adopt different personalities in the different seasons because one season is more egalitarian, one season is more hierarchical, and we, we adopt different ritual personalities. Quite beautiful art, some of the most beautiful art in the world. They, their economy, so why are they so hierarchical? They have nobility, they have commoners, they have hereditary chiefs, they have wealth inequality. Why? Well, because their hunting and gathering is fishing, and their fishing is based on specific river resources. And in order to get the fish from those resources, you need to control that territory. In a nomadic hunting and gathering situation, just everyone can just go anywhere. There's no piece of land that you need to afford or control or defend. You're following animals. In a salmon economy, you are, it's like farming, basically. You're taking a piece of land and you're defending it. And once you do that, well, first of all, you have to have land management. How do you manage land? Well, by family. And then you're going to have disputes. People are going to be fighting all the time if they're staying in one place and if they have to argue about who gets what. So you start to have uh, the, so like the, the fundamental hierarchy, which is the the, the tribe or the clan, and usually you'll have some kind of gerontocratic system where the eldest common ancestor will be the chief or the, the clan leader or whatever it is, the tribe leader. This, this, the word tribe, we used to think that tribe is anybody who's running around in a grass skirt, but tribes are specific, like those immediate return hunter-gatherers don't have tribes. They just are people. They have families, they have cousins, but they don't have tribes. Tribes happen when you have some collective property to manage and you do it by usually the oldest common ancestor, and you, you trace your lineage. And lineage is very important because that's your property management team, right? And therefore, some people control better salmon territories than others. Some people are older than others, so they have the final say in decision-making. So you get that kind of fundamental hierarchy, that sort of gerontocracy. But basically, you have land that people depend on to survive, and as soon as you have some people that control something that other people depend on to survive, you have hierarchy. And that's it. And it's not that easy to run away. If you run off, you're not going to get that beautiful salmon. And there are other people, you know, who knows how it was uh, 20,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, but in the historical times, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, they couldn't just go off. Someone who just didn't like that hierarchy couldn't just go fuck off to, uh, you know, join some other group because they'll just get killed because there's those competing groups in other places. So another ingredient for hierarchy is that you can't leave. It's where it's difficult or costly to leave because you could have wealth inequality. Jeff Bezos can, you know, he owns a lot of stuff, but he doesn't affect me. He has no power over me because I have other jobs that I can go to in capitalism. I have to be under some kind of lord, <laughs> the landlord or whatever, but, you know, his power is not the same as Stalin's power. He might have more wealth than Stalin had, but Stalin controlled where you went. Jeff Bezos can't control where you go. So his power is much less. So in those societies in the Pacific Northwest as well, they had, which is very interesting, like different seasons where things could become more more egalitarian. Can you can you discuss that and, and what's the kind of 
materialist reason behind that kind of occurrence. So it's interesting. So David Graeber points to that those societies and other societies who had different social structures or tendencies towards different social structures in different seasons. So in the winter, I think is the season with the Pacific Northwest Coast people where they're more hierarchical. And in the summer, they are more egalitarian. Now, they're not completely egalitarian, but the hierarchy is much less pronounced and they have also different ritual identities. Really interesting. But the material reasons, so David Graeber talks about it as if it's just, they were just experimenting with different ideas. And, and I guess he was sort of hinting at the ideas that the summer is a different landscape. So we have different ideas and different cosmology and somehow our social structure comes from this. But that's nonsense. What it is, is in the winter, everybody's in one place, everybody's in the village, and you have people depending on the resources of other people. And people can't just move and people can't just leave. So hierarchy is more pronounced. In the summer, they're broken down. They were broken down into smaller bands where they would go off uh, hunting or they would go off raiding. And there's just, you don't have the same mechanism and the same means of control over people that you have. So people, you know, people have bargaining power and they assert more rights. When a worker in a capitalist workplace, when there's a labor shortage, you start to tell the boss, ah, fuck you. I'm going to come in at 10 o'clock because I feel like it, you know? If there's not, that rarely happens in capitalism, but you know it does happen sometimes, and then you can see people start like loosening their belts and, and relaxing at work a little bit. You can see that people make these calculations in their mind, and so cult- humans do this everywhere, and in these cultures, people do this too. But then they ritualize it, and they, you know, culture basically exists to stabilize our adaptation to our environments, so that we're not just living in constant chaos. In a hierarchical society, you have hierarchical values. You're taught to uh, be obedient to authority. You're taught the, you know, you deserve to be on the bottom because you're a, you're a, you're a Dalit because you were crappy in your last life. And the Brahmin, he was great in his last life. That's why he's there. And you have that stuff because the balance of power is such that the people on top could probably dominate the people on the bottom anyways. But if you just have a constant battle over it all the time, then everybody's worse off. Even the people on the bottom, if they're constantly fighting, if they don't have much of a hope of winning, if you're constantly fighting, you're worse off. As much as it sucks you're better off just sort of submitting, you know, and just doing your daily thing. And this is, these are calculations we all make every day. Like, oh, do I want to go on strike? Do I want to, you know, uh, tell my boss to fuck off? Well, it's going to cost me so much and it's going to, it's very risky. Uh, so I'm not going to bother doing that. And are you going to be miserable in work every day? Are you going to be a communist and go to work every day understanding that you're exploited, that you're miserable, that you fucking hate this and that it's abuse? Or are you going to just try to love the system, you know, because that's an adaptation. Oh, you'll adopt the capitalist values. Well, if I work harder, I'll go up the chain. Oh, I smiled to, you know, my manager patted me on the head today, so I'm a good boy, and, uh, you know, I'll be manager someday, and I'll get the extra $3 an hour and double the responsibility, and this is great, and I'm moving up in the world. And these are the adaptations that we make to survive. And then when we see that conditions are a bit different, I talk about this in the new episode when we talk about the peasants rule, you had the Black Plague, which killed off 50% of the population, all of a sudden, there was a huge labor shortage, and the serfs, the, the the lords realized, like, holy shit, I don't have enough serfs on my land, so they're trying to poach serfs from some, some other lord's land. And then so they're enticing them with, oh, you'll only have to give me a quarter of your harvest instead of a, a third of your harvest. Oh, I'll pay some some cash as well. So the peasants started to realize, like, oh, I don't have to be obedient. I don't have to, you know, love my lord. And within 20 years, they're cursing the lords as a cla- parasitic class that shouldn't exist. You know, uh, you know the expression. I don't know. Do you know about the English peasants revolt? Did you learn that? Uh, uh, yeah, I do know about it generally, but not not too much to be honest. So you had these radical priests running around, and one of the slogans was, "When Adam delved and Eve span, who is then a gentleman?" And the idea is, well, God didn't. Adam and Eve had no nobles, and there was no hierarchy. So why should we have it? You know, these these people have just usurped God's plan. And these ideologies happen when people realize that they have power, that their bargaining power, that the existing hierarchy is not suited to the material conditions. When people realize like, oh, the material conditions are such that I can get more of a piece of the pie, your obedient values will tend to change, specifically over generations. Like your parents could be obedient, but you're coming up and you realize, I don't have to follow this shit, so you won't follow it, you know? So you said as well in, in one of the videos, you, you had something about how the actual shift into agricultural societies seems to be linked kind of to the climate change around, I think, is it the Holocene period? Yeah, exactly. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? So the Pleistocene 
the Holocene is our current ecological area. So people get mixed up because we talk about the Neolithic, the Paleolithic, and then the Pleistocene and the Holocene. So the lithic ones means lithic is stone, and Paleolithic is old stone age, Neolithic is new stone age, Mesolithic is medium stone age. And these are about technologies and the types of technologies people, people use, but the geological areas are Pleistocene and Holocene. And the current era is the Holocene. And what happened is that about 12,000 years ago, the climate suddenly went through some big change. And the climate just changed drastically from what it had been before that area. And we evolved as a species during the Pleistocene era. And during this era, it was characterized by wild shifts of climate all over the place, which is probably why we're such a good generalist species, you know? Like mountain goats are good at staying in mountains, but if you put them in plains, they're not doing well. And then goats that live in plains don't do well in mountains. We're a generalist species because our climate was just changing all over the place. So, so to survive, we had to adapt. And part of that is having... Oh, sorry, I'm going to go back. I talked earlier about how hierarchy is like sugar consumption. So in these egalitarian societies, people are still pushing for a little bit more... You know, you have an ethos where everybody has to share. You get a tomato, you get a... This anthropologist gave a slice of tomato to, to one of her friends, one of the, the people she was studying or working with. And that person took that, there are 16 people around, so she cuts it up into 16 equal pieces and gave one to everybody. Because that's the culture. You have to share everything with everybody. Now, people don't always like that. And when nobody's looking, they found that hunter-gatherer people like, will, will be not stealing, but hiding stuff so that they don't have to share it, right? You know, because you're going to do better if, if you, your society will do better as a whole if everybody's sharing. But you as a person will do a bit better if you can sneak a little bit, you know? Now, you can't sneak too much so that you're going to become Jeff Bezos, but you can sneak a little bit. So people are always sneaking a little bit here, a little bit there. And hierarchy, in certain periods in time, some people were able to hoard a little bit more or sneak a little bit more for certain times. Like people might have adopted a, a riverine salmon economy for certain periods, but the climate was changing all the time. So you would have had a hierarchical society maybe for a couple of hundred years and then the climate would have changed and that, that would no longer be viable anymore. But we have, the same way we crave sugar, we also crave a little bit of selfishness, you know. But the material conditions were such that you couldn't get all that selfish back in the day, just for a little bit, for a couple of years here, a couple of years there. But nowadays, we have conditions where it's, it's possible to just become enormously selfish and hoard enormous amounts of wealth beyond all reason. So that's why I link hierarchy is kind of like our overlust for sugar to the point of getting diabetes. Now, the Holocene era. So 12,000 years ago, climate changes, and suddenly agriculture is possible. What they discovered quite recently, I think it was in 2008, they found some ice in, in Greenland <laughs> somehow, and they, they, they were able to determine how much carbon was in the atmosphere every year for like a zillion years, okay? A zillion is a scientific number. And they found that because there was no agriculture at all. There's no evidence of any ag agriculture anywhere until after 12,000 years. I think maybe it starts 11,000 years ago. But anyhow, and this was a mystery. Why? Why wasn't there agriculture? And it turns out that agriculture was not possible before 12,000 years ago because there was not enough carbon in the atmosphere so the, the soil wouldn't be fertile enough. So in the Pleistocene era, before the Holocene, when you would have a food shortage. Now, hunter-gatherer societies actually do better than agricultural societies in general. They're, they're better nourished. If you see a hunter-gatherer society living next to an agricultural society, they often have trade relations, and you see that the hunter-gatherers are better nourished. They have a more relaxed lifestyle. They're living an easier lifestyle. So hunting and gathering is preferable to farming. So people didn't switch to farming until they had to. They were forced into it. But before the Holocene era, it was not possible to switch to farming. You just had to starve to death or you went to war or, or some calamity. Now, after the Pleistocene starts, and also the population of the world is slowly growing, of human beings is slowly growing, and there's less and less room to sort of, you know, roam around freely and not uh, come into conflict with other people. So now, since 12,000 years ago, when you're in a position where your population is too big for the, the resources, you have the option of switching to agriculture. So people started switching to agriculture here and there in various places. And the same way that we saw for the Pacific Northwest Coast for hunter-gatherers, uh, where they had to control a piece of land and it results in a hierarchy for all the reasons we discussed, farming is the same thing. You have your piece of land, where your fertile area, and then you need to manage your fertile area. 
So you start to de develop these descent groups, these tribes, and then you have to uh, defend that area. And then there's all that whole series of things, and it makes, you know, originally, initially, you see that those groups tended to be quite egalitarian as well. Egalitarian is, is a culture, you know, culture does last. It is important. It has uh, an effect on people. It, it motivates our choices. And so people stay egalitarian for a while, but slowly you see in all these societies after a few hundred, sometimes a few thousand years, the hierarchy emerges because the population is too dense. There's competition with others. That's just the ingredients for hierarchy. Some people are able to control resources that other people depend on. On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar.